The other three series, as great as they are, didn't have nearly as great character arcs. And I'll tell you why. Because we boldly stayed in one place. (laughs) (laughs) We're talking about Deep Space Nine, and we have three fantastic people with me. Immediately to my right, I always get my stages wrong, but wonderful actress, uh, musician, and author, as you'll learn in this panel, the great Nana Visitor. Uh, One of the great characters I I was just talking about beyond Deep Space Nine, uh, this guy played Liberace in a fantastic television movie. Of course, we know him as the score, uh, was was it the Scorpio Killer? Scorpio Killer. Yeah, Dirty Harry, and one of my favorite crime movies with Walter Matthau, Charlie Varick, the great Ray Andrew Robinson. And also an author, also an author. Author, uh, excuse me, thank you, Armin, indeed, also an author. And come on, man, Beauty and the Beast, Brooklyn Bridge, so many other great roles over the years, and also a very accomplished uh, Shakespearean scholar, performer, teacher, Armin Shimmerman. Also everyone. an author. Also, also an, an author. author. Hey, shame on me. <laughs> awesome. Thank you. That's great. <laughs> Guys, I, I really wonder, because as you've all explained to me in interviews, Deep Space Nine was kind of, you know, it, it was the next generation. It came alongside of it. But it was kind of, to use the metaphor, the bald-headed stepchild that, like, you know, <laughs> really, like, you know, I don't know if, and you guys can explain it better if Paramount didn't know how to, what to do with you or whatever. But, I mean, my God, this wonderful wave of acceptance. I mean, we all love all of iterations of Star Trek, but really, it's been really great to see, especially when you guys made the uh, What You Leave Behind documentary, too, just the love that we all still have for this show that you stopped doing 25 years ago. I mean, you know, so yeah, I mean, can you, I mean, is it, is it a fantastic? I mean, again, you've had your predecessors as examples as well, but is it surprising that there is this much love for Deep Space Nine? Well, first of all, what I found when I was writing the book and talking to people from all the series, every single series got the same thing. You're ruining Star Trek. Ha! Even Next Generation. Yes, yes. <laughs> they were, you are ruining Star Trek. And, and when I talked to uh, one of the uh, executive producers of uh, Discovery, I said, I've got one question for you. Did you get, and we both said, you're ruining Star Trek. It was like, okay, yeah, we all got it then. <laughs> it's, uh, but, you know, it was serialized. And in the 90s, that wasn't a form that was easy, especially when they put us all over the place. I mean, you, you could hardly find the show. Um, right. And during the pandemic, a lot of people went, all right, I got to watch something. I want to watch Star Trek. Let's finally see DS9. And I remember seeing on Twitter, now X, it saying someone wrote, DS9 is trending. Why? <laughs> 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 yes, we, we lived in the shadows for a long time. And, and yes, streaming and COVID and everything else helped bring us to the forefront. And uh, we are immensely grateful. We are immensely grateful because we told great stories. Um, and we're very proud of the stories. And, and I do think that they left us alone uh, because they were focused on other things. And because of that, Ira and the writers and, and the, all the designers and the artists involved in the show got to do, to, to break the envelope, to go beyond what was expected. And because of that, we told phenomenal stories. That's great. That's excellent. Yeah. Andrew? Well, you know, I know all, all of that is true. Um, they, they didn't help us by kind of impinging us, uh, you know, from at the beginning we were sharing the, you know, the stage with Next Generation, which by then had had found its way, and, Certainly. and it was the, you know, the 800-pound gorilla. And then they, they squeezed in uh, Voyager, you know, right. before we were over. So. To start UPN, yeah, and, right. and really yeah. the, the flagship show of UPN, yeah, absolutely. Exactly, yeah. You know, I wonder, I, and really, I'm so glad Nana mentioned it. First of all, Nana, I want you to promote your book. It's coming up October, right? Yes, it's out uh, October 1st. It's on sale, pre-sale now. Uh, on Amazon, and it's called Open a Channel, and I really hope it does. Well, and you're, as you said, it's kind of an oral history. You're interviewing both people in front of the camera and behind the scenes as well, the women. Yeah, and it's the, it's the women of Star Trek, what they were going through in the decades that they were filming in, but what they were projecting to the audience 
was this hope for a future for women that really inspired people to go, wait a minute, yeah, I can be an engineer. I can, you know, and not only women. I remember talking to a, a man who was the child of a single woman watching TNG and found self-acceptance because Gates McFadden's character, Dr. Crusher, had was a, a professional woman with a single child, and he went, hey, you know, I think Wesley's pretty cool. I must be cool, too. Did everyone else have trouble in their cities with preemption for Deep Space Nine? So I was in Chicago. I was telling Nana the other day that Cub, Cub Games would preempt it. And the week before it would be preempted, they'd have a crawl at the bottom. Make sure you catch the next chap, uh, episode on a special night. And man, my VCR, I, don't, I think I broke at least three VCRs, <laughs> keeping track of you guys and having the timer run and everything. But I got them. So I, I, saw, I didn't have to wait for streaming. I got it all. Um, Armin and, and Andrew, I'm curious because both of your characters, when we first meet them, even Andrew, in a more benign way, when he's sitting down to have uh, lunch with Bashir, but uh, really both of you, we don't know if we can trust you guys. Well, that, that, I don't know how benign that, that first scene was. I mean, <laughs> the, I was, I've told this to a few people today. The reason I got that job is because uh, of Garrick is because they were looking for a storyline for, for Sadig playing uh, Dr. Bashir. And because he was kind of being left out as he was being one of the regulars. So they figured, well, we'll, we'll get this old Cardassian spy in there and see what happens. And, and, quite on, and so and at the same time, I'm struggling with figuring out what a Cardassian is. I have no idea what a Cardassian <laughs> is. <clears throat> I saw a bit of, you know, David Warner torturing Picard and, and, and Mark Alimo, and I thought, nah, I don't want to do that. You know, what can I do? And so I came up with this idea that uh, if, if he's a, an alien, then, you know, okay, you have to, you're a humanoid, you can't help it. I mean, you know, you, they, all our aliens have to be human, humanoid in some way, no matter how you try to, you know, much makeup you slap on us. So I tried to figure, okay, what's, what is a Cardassian, what do Cardassians do, you know, what's, what's, what differentiates themselves? And I was really struggling with this, and this is, this is a true story, and, and why I think I got the job. So I'm in full gear. I haven't even met Sadig before we're shooting. And uh, I'm, standing, I'm standing around waiting for our scene to begin. And I haven't even met Sid. And I see him. And Sid is one of the most beautiful men I have ever seen in my life. And I'm thinking, that's it. That's the thing. Garrick falls head over heels for this guy. And so, if you, if you remember in that very first scene, when I come up around behind him, and I put my hand on his shoulder, and I say, hello, and, <laughs> and Sid, Sid picked it up immediately and sold it. He came up with this, remember, I don't know if you remember, you remember his expression, which was wonderful, which was, you know. <laughs> <laughs> And, and that's, I'm convinced, that's why, that's why I, it was more than just a one-off, you know, to play Gary. Yeah. I think it's because you're an extraordinary actor is why they kept you. Well, might be, that, might yeah. be. <laughs> Armin, am I misreading uh, the initial mistrust of Quark? I mean, yes, the Ferengis absolutely. were antagonists. Quark was the most trustworthy character on I'm sorry, <laughs> of course you were. <laughs> um, I, I always thought so. <laughs> Maybe the others didn't, but I did. He <laughs> Do you know? By Go ethos, ahead. he lived by he li he he lived by ethics that were his culture's ethics. That's right. Absolutely, absolutely. Mm. Well, no, and immediately I got the Casablanca connection right away. Not even that necessary. Although later, when he was with Mary Crosby, there was that kind of Casablanca story that Gary or pardon me, Quark had to have. Do you all know that Andrew initially auditioned for Reich for Quark? No, you, for Odo. Odo. Was the, for Odo. Odo, pardon me. Odo, okay. Yeah. Wow. Max was Man. the other choice for. Oh, excuse me. That's right. Thank you, Armin. Yeah. Absolutely. Listen, everybody, I'm sure you all have questions, and I always get to talk to these people one on one, but this is like your time. So please line up to the microphone rather than ask from the audience mm -hmm. so we just kind of can get a, you know, a little more semblance of what's going on. But yeah, sir, if you're ready, I'll let you start yes. right away. Hi, uh, my name is Eric. I was over at uh, Donna's uh, table earlier. So the question I was going to ask was uh, during the scenes where Cisco is like, he talks with the prophets and the prophets take on 
you guys, the characters, like not like uh, Kira or Quark or even Gary, how did y'all like translate that over from your regular characters? Because you had to talk a certain way because the prophets, you know, talked in riddles. And so how did y'all shoot that? And then how did y'all like um, translate that from your original character and the way your original character like talked? Or acted. You're the only one, you know. Yeah. I'm the only one yeah. who did that? Yeah. Uh, you know, I can't recall, but I'm very good at going from one thing to another in my mind. Mm -hmm. Terribly enough, as a human myself, but I can drop something and go to something else very easily. And I, I think that's the way I did it. It was just... Uh, yeah, I remember I, I played a, a multiple personality once uh, because I'm good at doing that. Yeah. <laughs> and, oh, and then the other question for you I had was how, for Nana. For Nana. How, how, for Nana. how fun was it to play your mirror? Uh, that I was going to say as well. And honestly, I want to know all of you guys, yeah, your the mirror, mirror universe, the intended, come on, the intended. I mean, we love Kira and she's amazing, but obviously traumatized by her backstory. Uh, no, no trauma for the intended. That's a free willing, very happy person. That That's yeah. She's, she's very happy in her world. That was, that was really, I felt like a panther. It was like, I own this. You moved like a panther. I own everything and everybody. And so that was a really interesting place to be. But I'll tell you, the costume was awful. <laughs> it was rubber. I would sweat in it. And oh, they'd yeah. have to bring out this six-foot uh, uh, fan that I'd have to be like this in front of. so that Because it, it would make it black wherever I sweat. I'd have a big sweat stain on my stomach. Oh my God. So and not sexy. So, <laughs> so I was like this in between shots. And the other thing, it would be like, I'm going, so, but the reality was <laughs> it squeaked every move I made. Oh it God. squeaked. So I'm walking down. <laughs> so everything had to be looped. I had to go into post and add dialogue over wow. everything that I did. So the character was great. The costume, but I think it's the costume that people remember the most. So Bob Blackman <laughs> did an in Incredible job with that. Um, it may have squeaked, but it looked great. Well, and you sold it. I mean, seriously, man. I mean, you're just, you know, you're totally in full pose. And that, hey, man, that's the character. That's great. You, you can't shy away from a rubber suit. It's <laughs> what I think. You know, if I ever write a Star Trek, that'll be the chapter. <laughs> there it is. For, for Nana, absolutely. <laughs> Andrew, your mirror character still... Whichever way the wind's blowing, that's who I'm with and everything. That's cool. How would you describe Mirror uh, Garrick? I hated Mirror Garrick. I really did. Playing him or, or just... No, I hate playing him. Go on, why? I'm playing him because it, it was... I lost the dimensionality of Garrick. That's fair. Garrick had, sure. has a subtext. Garrick was, you know, uh, I mean, complex. Garrick was... Um, he, he was fun uh, because he was sitting behind his smile and so forth and, and having whatever he was thinking and doing whatever he was doing. Mm. I mean, I, I, but, the, but the mirror, you know, uh, universe, Garrick, he, he was like a lot of bad television that I'd done in the 70s. <laughs> sure. <laughs> Bar a bad Barnaby Jones villain, yeah, essentially. You know, like, you know the, uh, the bad guy. Stick him up. Get, well, but I always know. did feel there was like a survival mode of, you know, hey, you don't want to piss her off. You don't want to piss, oh, no, no, you don't no. want to piss Worf off, and, you know. And, and, then, and then, but the worst was when I had to sit at Michael Worf's feet chained to him, you know. I mean, I was so miserable. So miserable. It's the only time, you know. Otherwise, Garrick was a joy. Mere quark? I died. You did. <laughs> Very early. Very early, yeah. Lucky you. That was cool to see, though, that Max took over and then ultimately Nog uh, took over and everything. And they killed off a of Ferengi in every Mirror Universe. They did. Yeah, I they was did. not happy about the Mirror Universe. With the exception, truly, of Michael and Nana. And really, you guys, say you got to work with what you got. But I really did feel that at the end, it's like, all right, I think, you know, too much Mirror Universe. Let's, right. let's move Absolutely. on. But yeah, great question, man. Please, sir. Hi, somebody who I've met already and had conversations with, which I thank you for. 
My name is Randy. My question for you is, given the tradition of Star Trek, by the time you got there, was there any of that, I'm trying to find the right words, was there any of that tradition a burden to you as you discovered your character? Any, any pressure or any feelings mm. about that? Interesting. Uh, I'll start with that, because I had a, a huge burden. I, I, uh, I've told the story many times, forgive me for repeating it, but um, I hated what I did as the first Ferengi on Next Generation, mm -hmm. just, just despised what I did. It was my fault, nobody else's, my fault. I take full responsibility for it. So I had a huge responsibility in my own head, which was I had to, uh, I had to change the Ferengi that I had created and change them into something else. That was an enormous responsibility for me personally. And, and I took it very seriously, and I'm very grateful for what the writers did to help me in that journey. I had no, no burden at all because, the, you know, there was, there was not much of a Cardassian uh, presence uh, before Garrick. As I say, there was uh, Mark Alimo and David Warner, mm -hmm. and they were that militaristic kind of uh, character, Cardassian, that I, that I wasn't. Um, my role was originally written for Michelle Forbes, who was Ensign Rowe in Next Gen. Mm -hmm. And uh, the writers told me that they hired her, um, I mean, they told me this much later, because they realized there was an issue with, you know, the rule that everybody got along in the Federation, so they needed some kind of friction to make fire. And she was a fire starter, especially for the character of Picard, and it made him have different colors and do different things. Um, and she's a wonderful actor. So I had, uh, although I never watched her, I was, I didn't see her till much later, till recently when I wrote the book, I went and saw her scenes, um, because I was afraid it would somehow, uh, uh cut into what I wanted to do with it. So I didn't have her influence, but my God, she was wonderful on Picard. Thank you. you know if I could ask Nana, were you concerned about being stereotyped? Because you, that was still, it was 99. And there, you know, I mean, it's the Adam West syndrome of, well, you're Batman. I don't know if I want to see you in anything else. And this is casting people saying that. Did you have, I mean, because again, the guys were lucky to be in makeup so they could hide behind their masks. How was it for you? Uh, uh, I, I may have gotten stereotyped, but I can't imagine a job as an actor where what's important to me, feeling like I have this full spectrum, this huge room to play in, and connection and purpose. I can't imagine another job offering all of that, so I'm cool if I got stereotyped yep. as Major Kira. It's yep. all right with me. Yeah. Uh, I, I know Andy has told me that he's had the same reaction, so I'll speak for both of us. Uh, if we walked into a casting session and the people were very nice, oh, I love your work, you're a terrific actor, immediately knew I'm not getting this job. Ah, uh, no, I understand. The they're already death, thinking of you. Oh, uh, we, we think you're an amazing actor. And immediately I knew, okay, let's get a out bomber. Of here. Yeah, yeah might as well leave now. That's that. Uh, yes, yeah, so sometimes it's not stereotype, it's pigeonholed. Yeah. Respectfully, yes. Yeah, you get pigeonholed into things. And, and for instance, uh, I'm sure uh, oftentimes my agent will call and say, uh, they won't see you. And I say, oh, why won't they see me? Well, you're a science fiction actor, so they, they're, they're doing a, so, a thriller, so yeah. yeah, they can't use you. You're great, great brains, great minds run this business. <laughs> I mean, and, and, after, after Dirty Harry, yes, I, 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 I didn't, I, except for Don Siegel, I didn't work for nearly a year and a half. I Jeez. mean, I did plays, you know, but, sure. you know, but I mean, but it was like amazing. I'll tell you one story, too, and this, I never feel, never, you know, tired of telling a story because it was so amazingly typical of our business. So shortly after Dirty Harry is released, I have a, I, 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 I'm, I was still living in New York, and so I was out, out in California, and, uh, and I was way out in, you know, on the beach somewhere, and they called me and they said, listen, you have, a, you have an appointment uh, at Warner Brothers, and there's this uh, casting director, Barbara Miller, who wants to meet you. And I said, okay, great. And it was a schlep. And of course, I'm being a New York, you know, actor and not knowing LA. It took me forever to get out to Burbank and Warner Brothers. And I got to the door, you know, and uh, came in and the 
this, this uh, assistant comes running up to me. She says, oh, I'm so sorry. I'm, I'm so sorry, but Barbara can't meet you. She's something, you know, has taken her away. And I, and I was pissed because I drove all the way out there. And she said, you know, she'll see you another time. And I said, well, I, I don't think so because I'm not going to be around. Okay. Anyway, so years later, I'm at a Hollywood party and I run into Barbara Miller. And she comes up to me and she says, you know, I'm so sorry, I have to tell you something. I apologize for something. I said, what? She says, at that time when you came to my office <clears throat> and, and you had an appointment, uh, uh, I saw you coming up the path. And I turned to my assistant and I said, I, I asked, who is that? And then the assistant said, well, that's Andy Robinson. That's your next, you know, he was in this movie, Dirty Harry. And she said, I don't want to meet him. I don't want to meet him. I, I apologize to him and tell him he, I don't want to meet him. And that was it. Wow. That was it. That was what happened to me for about a year and a half with that. Yeah. Well, again, you were playing, like you said, Don Siegel, Dirty Harry, and, and Charlie Varick. Yeah, you know, you right. were playing these extreme characters. But I wouldn't pass, because usually the, 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 the bullshit that I would, you know, the kind sure. of crap that I would go up for, would, you know, couldn't hold a candle to the movies with, working with Don Siegel. So, you know, at the I time, it. it was upsetting, but believe me, I am grateful. If you haven't seen Charlie Varick, the Walter Matthau movie that yeah. An Andy made as well, unbelievable crime movie, and it's so great to see Walter Matthau in a, in a serious role mm -hmm. rather than, you know, his great comedy yeah. and stuff. Armin, do you guys know Brooklyn Bridge? Uh, a 90s show that Armin did right before DS9, a complete 180, and that's why I respect what you said about being pigeonholed, Armin, but truly nothing like Quark, a very meek cousin in this family. Marion Oros was the matriarch of the family. Louis Zorich was the grandfather. Great show, and I, I've told you before, I love that show. So, yes, thank you for that. The Brooklyn Bridge was a phenomenal show. Uh, we were, it was a half-hour sitcom, but it was a three-camera uh, and in sitcoms, what usually happens is you rehearse um, and then you shoot it on the final day. Uh, and usually it's five days of, of work. Uh, Brooklyn Bridge was a half hour and we worked for eight days and we rehearsed for, for seven days and was shot it on the eighth day. Um, and it was like doing a play. Wow. It was, an, it was, it was, it was like doing a play. Um, I, I can't explain the difference. These guys understand. But it, it, it was so rehearsed. Um, and it was phenomenal actors. Marion Ross was extremely good. And I, if I may, a shout out to Brooklyn Bridge, because if I had not done Brooklyn Bridge, very likely I would not be sitting here today. Uh, about that time, right before Brooklyn Bridge, I was convinced that I was finished as an actor, that I was no longer going to get cast in anything. I'd had a very nice career in the theater. I'd come to L.A., I'd done a, a number of things, but, but I, at 40 years old, I, I looked in the mirror and said, who the hell is going to hire you? Um, you don't look like you know, other actors. Uh, you, you're, you're a little bit larger than life. Um, so I thought, I, I've got to quit because I've, I've got a wife to take care of, and, and, I, and I was just ready to go. And I was looking for other jobs. If a teaching job had come along, I probably would have taken it. But uh, out of the blue, I didn't audition, and that had never happened before. I just got a phone call saying they want you for Brooklyn Bridge. And doing Brooklyn Bridge uh, restored my confidence in my ability. And so uh, a year after uh, I, I did Brooklyn Bridge, I had the audition for Quark, and I went in with some confidence because I had been doing Brooklyn Bridge, and uh, that may have swayed the difference. And also Ira Bear, who saw, saw every show on Earth and knew every actor on Earth. Ira, by the way, who was, who was the guy who Actually, ran. Actually, he wasn't. Not and, at that time. You know, and I'm sure he saw Brooklyn Bridge. He might have, but, but it was Michael Pillar. And, and oh, Michael Pillar, that's yeah. right. He was the first real showrunner. Okay. That's right. That's excellent. Now, if you guys have a chance, Catchy Comedy, I think, runs it on weekends every now and then. Tremendous show. Really wonderful ensemble show. And Armin is great in it. Please, miss. Thank you. Hello, uh, this qu question is for um, Andrew. Um, your uh, character had such a hu huge arc from what, what looked like uh, a villain to heroic storylines. Was that the producer's intent or did that happen from when you first started to play the role and they recognized that you know, ability it, in you? It, that's a great question. I, I wonder about that myself. 
you know, I, quite honestly, I, I always expected to, you know, I, I always looked forward, by the way, because I love playing Garrick so much, I always looked forward to a script when a script came, because, you know, and it would come occasionally, because uh, I wasn't a regular like these guys. And so, but I was always thrilled when the script came, but I was always afraid that it was going to be the end of Garrick, because I thought, they got to kill Garrick. They're, sooner or later, they got to kill him, you know. <laughs> Um, and, I, and I would have bet money on it, and I'm not a betting person. The fact that that arc happened, the way it ended, was astounding to me. Where I end up being sort of like this, you know, it, it, this, this, a leader of the, of the rebellion. I mean, it was amazing. And I don't know if they, I don't think they had planned it. I really don't think they had planned that. But I, th I think basically that as this, you know, as, as that series went on and so forth, you know, they became more invested in Garrick. And then, of course, that, that final storyline, which was extraordinary. Then I, I have to ask, and I asked you also when it was just you and me talking, um, the changes in Kira. Kira, Kira goes from being a, a rebel for her people and an oppressed rebel to having to deal with the Federation. And then finally, the ultimate irony, irony, your oppressors, you have to train them to be rebels. And as I said, yeah. within and certainly in today's world, we can all appreciate the different world conflicts that have been going on. I wondered if that was in your mind, but also what a gift to, to have that kind of evolution in your, in your play. Yeah, and the guest stars that we had that, that helped. I mean, Louise Fletcher, Having to having that character come against Kai Win come up against Kira, Kira could no longer just be an emotional reactor. She had to become political in order to deal with this force that Kai Win was. So that was huge in taking my character somewhere else. Casey was as well. Casey Biggs. You know, I, I just. Uh, my husband and I just spent the weekend with Casey and his wife, and he brought up a, a story that I remember. The first time Kira flipped his character, we got into a physical fight, and f I flipped him, and he's all, you know, bloody and everything. He was like, now, now, wait a minute, wait a minute, guys. He was like, could she really do this? And they were like, yes. So. Awesome. Awesome. Fantastic. That's great. Man, and that, and that whole arc, the, Dominion, the end of the Dominion War, the 10 episodes, as they said, you know, now we're used to serialized television that way. That's right. But that's, that was really exciting. And also, the stories and your characters earned that kind of story where it's like, we know you all. And now it's interesting seeing you in this really dire situation where shit's really hitting the fan and how you're all reacting to it. And my God, Andrew, you had, uh, you know, uh, I forget which, uh, where they were all on a planet and it was just you and Worf on the ship. And it's like, well, we got to kill the, you know, we got to shoot at the planet. It's like, we'll kill everybody. Well, the, you know, needs of the many, well, you know, that kind of thing. <laughs> and it's, I mean, again, the turns you guys had. Yeah. Please, sir. Um, yeah, so you had talked about uh, Deep Space Nine becoming more popular when streaming hit and everything like that. And for years before that, it was you know definitely considered um, the underdog of all the series. Unfortunately, because in my opinion, you, as she mentioned, you guys had the best character arcs. You told the best stories. Um, and it also featured several episodes where uh, far, I think it was Far Beyond the Stars, where it showcased you outside of your characters and showed you different acting abilities as other people. Um, the best character arc, um, unfortunately, is no longer with us, Aaron Eisenberg as Nog, where first episode, he's a thief and he's stealing anything. And I think he had his, one of his first scenes with you, Nana, and then he had his last scene with you as well, where he just got made a lieutenant. Wow. And again, best character arc out of all the series. The other three series, as great as they are, didn't have nearly as great character arcs. And I'll tell you why. Because we boldly stayed in one place. <laughs> right. And so, and so the, the recurring characters, Andy, Aaron, Max, the hundreds of other recurring characters, Mark Alimo, Jeffrey, Jeffrey, Casey, Casey uh, all of those, they could develop 
because we weren't leaving them behind. They were, we were all living together. And that's the, that's the, yeah. the thesis of, of Deep Space Nine. How do people who don't necessarily like each other learn to live together? And, and isn't that something we all face, whether it's on TV or in real life? Yeah. Amen. Amen. So, uh, sorry, uh, the question I am after that is, what were your favorite scenes with Aaron Eisenberg? Oh. He always brought up to me the dance, the, yeah. the little feral <laughs> dance that he did with me. And he actually had me work on it with him. He was like, no, 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 what can I do? This is, this is an important moment. This is, a, this is a Ferengi dancing. Now, how should it be? And he took so much time and thought with that little strange, weird thing that he did. That's and uh, that always sticks in my head <laughs> because I remember off camera as well as on. I don't know about scenes, but I, I do want to mention something. Aaron spoke to me often. Actors often have this problem. They're not quite sure they're doing it right. They're not quite sure that, that they're good enough for, for the ensemble. Aaron was always concerned that his acting wasn't good enough. And now that he's passed away, I hope he's hearing this somewhere, how much people liked his performance. He was quite brilliant. It was wonderful. It was wonderful. Yeah. yeah. No, I, I, Aaron and I, you know, sadly, really didn't have anything much. To am I, am I is, again, because I, I'm Rain Man when it comes to this stuff, sadly, chapter and verse. The Empak Noor episode where you get crazy. Did That's, you have scenes with him there? Or? I don't remember. I, okay. I actually, I don't. I, I only remember Colm. I only remember, sure. You know, you know, the torturing Colm, which I enjoyed. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Please, sir. Uh, hello, um, Deep Space Nine. I watched all the Star Treks. My favorite Star Trek by far, um, because of what the gentleman before said. The character development was just amazing. Um, and I agree with him as well. Um, Nog's character, best character development in all of Star Trek, I believe. So I just would like to ask you guys, uh, of the characters in the show, which, which uh, characters did you like, um, which character arcs did you like watch develop? Like, what was your favorite development for a character. I mean, other than the, uh, the other character than that, that yeah. like, like what's, What was your favorite You know, I've been, I've been asked that question before, and I got to tell you, I was so happy not to have gotten Odo, because the, the right person got Odo. Mm -hmm. uh, the, yeah. Definitely the right person. And I'm so glad I got Garrick. <laughs> I was Garrick. I'm, I mean it. There, I've, I've had a couple roles in my life, been very fortunate where the role I played has changed my life, and Garrick was one of them. I didn't want to be anybody else. Mm -hmm. Um, <clears throat> I'd say that Terry's, uh, there was a metamorphosis there that I mm -hmm. thought was wonderful. Uh, and it was really the writers, and they, they talked to me about this, the fact that they tried to make her be these multitudes and have this age, but she just talked about it until they finally figured out at a certain point, no, she's got to do all these things. She's got to have... Oh, you know, uh, Klingons who are blood brothers of hers and, she's, and, and show her, show all the multitudes in her. So I thought that was a wonderful shift and a great arc for Terry. And I would have to point to Max Grudenchek and Rom. Um, That's right. When in the first episode, Rom doesn't even have a name. He's simply the... the the double wheel dealer. That's the that's the what it said in the script. But he does say, "I'm Quark's brother," and to see the development from him being a complete idiot to uh, <laughs> to a uh, uh, enormously Grand sympathetic, Nicus. kind, concerned father for one thing, uh, uh, a, a brilliant physicist and, and engineer. Um, to see that arc and to watch Max deal with that, uh, and Max did a phenomenal job doing it, um, that's the arc that I'm quite impressed right. with. Cool. You know, I'm sorry, I misunderstood your question. Oh. I'd have to say Ciroc. Oh, Ciroc, cool. oh, Ciroc, he was like, yeah, and, yeah. and the thing is, there was a natural organic 
uh, you know, growth to his character, obviously, since he, he, he grew from boyhood to manhood, pretty much on the show. Mm. But he, he had, I mean, and he had this, this, this steadiness, this clarity about him, even when he was a young boy. And the way he, I mean, I, it was very impressive. And I think he has been kind of underlooked uh, uh, because they just assume, well, he's just the kid. He was just, you know, Cisco's son. Very cool. Thank Thanks, you. man. Thank you. Miss. Hi. So I know a lot of Trek actors, including yourselves, have spoken about things that you wanted to change about your characters or do that were rejected. Was there anything you really wanted to change that was actually accepted? No. <laughs> <laughs> no. I won one battle with Ira Stephen Bear, and it was that he wanted me to have been romantically involved with Ducat, and I, I, yeah. I was like, <laughs> it can't ever happen. It can, it can be a Cardassian, but not that one. Yes. Um, <laughs> and and uh, he, he said, okay, because it was coming up in the next script, and the next script, it was my mother that he had been romantically involved with. Oh, they literally changed it for them? Yes. Interesting. Wow. Yeah. Great. That's Holy so cow. Great. Man. Is that it? Before we get to you, I, I, I got I to ask uh, Armin and Andy, because Armin and I talked about it, and I want to get Andy, and also Andy and I did a year ago as well, but the root beer scene. Do we all know the root beer scene during oh, Way of the Warrior? Yeah, yeah. Come on. I mean, seriously, that is like one of the greatest Star Trek conversations about the Federation. I'll let you start, Andy. But, no, you know, no, that, that, that was the only battle. It wasn't a battle, but that was the only time that, you know, that, that I, I, certainly I was involved in a situation where we changed something, uh, a, a scene that Armin and I couldn't make work. And we said, listen, you know, we, it was a Jim Conway who was directing, yeah. Said, Jim, sorry, man, you know, you, know, you, you got to get the writers down here because this is not working. And, th and they came down and, uh, you know, and basically we thrashed it out. And from being a very kind of boring, meaningless scene, it became something that was good. Jim Conway said to Andy and I, well, uh, he asked us to read the scene, and, and Andy and I had been working on it in my house during the weekend, and we had found subtleties uh, there, because after all, it was a scene between um, two connivers. Uh, one is a very smart one, one is a, uh, not so smart. And uh, no, no, no. they both were smart, <laughs> don't we? Yeah, he's, he's still trying to kid you. Um, and, uh, uh, so we read it, and he looked at us, and he said, uh, it's not funny. And, and right. Andy and I said, uh, we don't think the scene is funny. And he said, well, my marching orders from the writer-producers is that it has to be a funny scene. And uh, that's when uh, we said we had to have the writers down. And they took a look, and uh, Ira said to Andy and I, can you do it our way? And we did it that way, because we're good actors, and we can take direction, and we did it. And then he said, now, how do you want to do it? And, and we showed them what we thought was there in the scene, the subtlety that was there in the scene. And uh, he and uh, Robert Hewitt Wolf, one of the other writers, um, discussed it for, I think, 20 seconds at the most, and then turned to Jim and said, yeah, do it Armin and Andy's way. And then, in fact, we had to redo it. Uh, right. Because we had done it, they realized there was something there that they had missed, and so they rewrote the scene, and the scene that you saw is the rewritten scene. Wow. That's right. Yeah, I'd forgotten that. Outstanding. Do you think they can save us? I hope so. You know, yeah. it's, it's just, and the desperation. I mean, you just played it so well, Andy, in terms of just, you know, again, a little contempt still, but are we screwed? And you're like, yeah, I hope we're not screwed. I mean, that was beautiful. That great, great button to that scene. That's how so. I feel today. <laughs> anyway, yes. <laughs> so my, my question is similar to the last person's question. Um, at any point when you were working on the show, was there ever like an aspect or a direction that you wanted your character to go that you weren't able to? Do you remember? Um, I was, uh, I didn't realize this until years after the show was over, uh, when Ira shared with me. I always wanted to make Quark more serious. And, and he wanted it to be a comic character. So um, I always wanted to push the envelope towards gravitas, and, and he 
he wanted it to be farcical. So uh, that, was the, that was the conflict we had, and I didn't even know we were having a conflict, but he told me years later that there, there was that in the writer's room. But, but it was not, I, you know, conflict is, but it was a dynamic to, to the, to the, that added to the character, that gave the character a, a, a real breadth, I thought. Well, again, I go back to one of the original questions. I, I was so embarrassed by my first Ferengi performance that I was trying to change it, so that was, uh, yeah. that was my POV. What, what, what was that, for? it was Next Generation? <clears throat> yeah, of course it would have been. And, and for me, no. I, I felt like I had such uh, freedom, uh, freedom that I was completely not used to in 90s uh, television roles available for women. So it was, it was like a huge playground, and I couldn't believe I got away with what I got away with at the time. That's awesome. Thank you. Um, Andy, am I right in A Stitch in Time? Did you, do you feel you addressed any unfinished? If you don't know, A Stitch in Time is the novel that, that Andy wrote. And by the way, um, last year, yes indeed, absolutely applaud. Thank you. Last year, they also uh, offered an audio version that, that, so you get Garrick's voice reading his story, which is fantastic. But was there unfinished business you feel in? A Stitch in Time that you were able to address? Well, yes, A Stitch in Time was written, you know, the, the, the initial impulse was be simply because, as I said earlier, I, I didn't know what a Cardassian was. I mean, I had no idea, and, and it was sort of annoying, you know, now I'm playing this alien, what the is this? <laughs> you know, I didn't know it from a ham sandwich. So, I, you know, basically, so I did this old, there's an old actor's thing that I've always done, you know, which is I always write bios for my characters, you know, just to give it some kind of background, some kind of subtext. And then I got so involved with, with, with the, the character was so amazing. I mean, it, it started basically because, you know, I didn't want to, when I, when I, I really didn't want to do this character. Um, and, uh, and they offered it to me. I, I turned down the audition because I'd gone in several times for Odo and they wanted me to come back for Garrick and I didn't, you know, if, you're gonna, you know, if you want, just offer me the damn thing. No, they don't do that. Irene, my wife, said, listen, no, the phone is not ringing off the hook. Go get the job and we got to pay the rent, <laughs> so forth. I went there and then, you know, it was okay. It, it was interesting. It was a good audition. But then when they started putting that, all that shit on me, right. you know, and I'm claustrophobic. <laughs> And I was, and it, I, and it was, oh. it really was. I was, yeah. I was really upset. My heart was pounding. I was on the, you know, makeup chair. And then the final thing was, after all that stuff, you know, and they, they put that, the wetsuit. and then they put the wetsuit on. And, and, and to make Cardassians look big, you know, some, someone came up to me yesterday and said, God, you're not as big as I thought. I thought you were, you know, yeah, so because they put all that furniture fucking padding on me, you know, and so forth. And so when that happened, I thought, and I, this is serious, I, I, and I thought, the, there's an old joke, and it's a crude joke, and forgive me, but who do I fuck to get out of this? And, you know, and, but, and, and so, and I was thinking about calling, calling my agent. I saw myself in the mirror, and this is absolutely true. I saw myself in the mirror, and I thought, this is an opportunity. This is so amazing, this, this, this character. And that's when I got, I got, I, I fell in love with Yarek. And that's when I started writing about it. Okay. How, how, and on the, when we're on the subject of makeup, both of you, and even Nana, here, let's go Nana, Andy, and then Armin. How many hours in the makeup chair to get you ready? Alien <clears throat> ready. So I had nothing like these two. Right. Uh, the whole thing was about an hour and a half. But when I was a Cardassian, oh, yes. my call That's was right. 1 a.m. and we started working at 7. That's oh. right. So it was six hours of makeup. Oh. Yeah. And it was like, why? A normal Cardassian isn't. But it was a Cardassian and then a beauty makeup on top That's of right. it. Interesting. Oh, sure. Now, no, not. The first Tell, time it was about five hours, and then they yeah. got it down to about two hours at the end of the show. Wow. Tell everyone the story about the time you slipped on the stairs and had to go to the doctor. Oh, yeah. Uh, oh, yes. Oh, yeah. So I was, I was still in my clothes because we'd go to makeup in our clothes and then change into our costume. This was the first year, so, you know, no one knew uh, Bajorans or that nose or anything, but my makeup artist was great. So I didn't have my hair done. I just had my makeup on, and I was leaving the makeup trailer, 
and I slipped, and you know, th those metal stairs hit them hard on my back, and it was like, I can't move. I didn't know what I'd done, but it felt bad. So they sent me to an emergency room, and the doctor, I, he's, he was very young, and he may have been you, but he came in, you know, going, so I hear you had a fall. Oh, my God! <laughs> <laughs> and he thought that I had accordioned my nose. <laughs> <laughs> I never heard that. And so I was very gentle in saying, no, no, it's a, you know, I'm doing a sci-fi thing. It's makeup. And he was like, yeah, yeah, no, I, I knew that. Yeah, so. sure. <laughs> <laughs> very cool. Hi, uh, thank you all for being here. Um, my question is for Nana. And to kind of piggyback off of an answer that you gave earlier, involving the storyline or the proposed storyline with Goldicott and your mother. What if Ira didn't cave in or the producers didn't cave in and, and said, this is the storyline? Then Kira would have been a different mm -hmm. person. Yeah. If, if, if that had been the storyline, I would have gone with Kira's not who I thought she was. Right. Um, it, it, that I, that's all I can think of. Uh, but I couldn't imagine, you know, I would make calls. I'm, I'm sure we all did when there were little things and go, listen, Ira. And he'd be like, nope. And I'm, okay. All right. And I was like, I get it. And so I, there, I had a history of a lot of nopes. So when I didn't go, okay, I get it. When I went, Ira, no, this is, this is big for me. And we really had it out. Um, and from, Two people from New York, you know, there was some yelling. Um, uh, that meant nothing. It was just how we communicated. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> but it. Ira. But, huh? That's how Ira communicated. <laughs> yes, yes. It's very heightened. It's yeah. very heightened if you know Ira. And so I think he took me seriously because I'd never fought before and I fought for this. Yeah, thank you. That's, but but Mark still, Ducat still played him as, oh, eventually you're going to, you know, see the light. Yes. And the whole Zial <laughs> dynamic of the three of you, because you really were sympathetic towards Zial. And there's that great moment when the station is still being occupied. And it's like, oh, you're almost a family. Hey, we're all going to have dinner tonight. And you're like, what the hell am I doing? Oh, my God, you know, yeah. that was awesome. And, and really, I love that Mark was still kind of pushing that and everything. Yeah. It, it added great tension to everything. Conflict, absolutely. Yes. <laughs> Hello, I mean, plain, simple, 21st century human. <laughs> human. <laughs> so anyway. Um, <laughs> anyway. Um, so the show had a bit of a stigma coming up again, right around uh, when TNG was in its final seasons. Did that in any way uh, influence how you approach your characters or your performances? What kind of stigma? Like, no, he's right. There was a stigma. Was there? Yeah, yeah. yeah please. Yeah. All right, well, you can explain it for me. I don't know, Dolly. You know, yeah, what kind of uh, we, we were the lost child. Oh, I bullies. see what you're saying. Yeah. Excuse me. I thought there was next generation stigma. Yeah. No, no, no. Yes, of course. You're not, you weren't next gen. They were doing films, you know. Well, we, sure. We were well, worrying whether or not we were going to be fired. Well, and also, <laughs> I mean, it was great that Miles was on DS9, but the first meetings with Cisco and Picard, he hates Picard. And it's like, that's dad. You're, you're not, and I, wait a minute, dad's going away. And now we're left with you people. We don't know you people. So I appreciate that. Please. Yeah. Uh, I don't think, uh, I don't think it changed any of our work, but we, as I've said, and others have said, we, we lived under a, a shadow for a very long time. Uh, one that I'm grateful we finally come out from underneath. Absolutely. Very cool. Excellent. Good thank luck you. on your beam back to uh, the 23rd or 24th century. <laughs> and thank you, and may the Force Prophets be with you. Thank you. <laughs> Are you cool with Star Wars people? Is, that, is there any little... I've also done Star Wars, so it's okay for Oh, me. there you go. Uh, yeah. okay. Armin, I didn't realize. Did yeah. you do vo uh, voice work for... Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. You know, very, very cool. Please, miss. Hi, um, my name is Kami, and I would like to start by just saying thank you so much for this amazing show. I, this was the first show I saw. I was eight. 
And thank you. Thank you very much. Six years later, thank it's you. still my favorite Star Trek show. <laughs> That's great. And I was just wondering if there were any episodes or scenes in, that you were particularly proud of. Uh, I think we're all very proud of Far Beyond the Stars. Cool. Which I wasn't in. And, and I, all you say is... You, and, that's, it, and that's why we're proud of it. It pissed me off. But even more pissed off when I wasn't in the baseball episode. <laughs> oh, that's I true. was the only one who could play baseball. Hey, oh, no, that's not true. And what a nightmare because I couldn't, I couldn't throw a ball. I remember one time Avery threw in a scene, he did an improv moment of throwing a bag at me for me to catch and we're off on a mission. And he couldn't believe it. He threw the bag at me, and I stood like this. <laughs> <laughs> and he was like, you have no instincts whatsoever. <laughs> if I throw this at you, don't you want to catch it? And I was like, no. <laughs> so they got me a coach for the baseball episode. <laughs> and I've still got a pretty mean arm from that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the Wire, it was the, uh, it, it was an episode sure. in the second season and it called The Wire. And it's, it's probably one of the handful of performances I'm most proud of. It's like it was, it's an episode where Garrick, it's sort of Garrick's origin story, but you don't know which story is true because he tells so many while he's, you know. Falling apart. That's right. Yeah, absolutely falling apart because the chip that he had that kind of controlled his tolerance of humans. Absolutely, that's good and, stuff. And there was a scene with Avery Brooks in this thing called In the Pale Moonlight, which is like... You know, well, yeah. yeah. You, well, the two of you really are the leads of that show and all the dirty things yeah. that uh, Avery had to do, and you're pulling him along. And again, man, they, again, the turns you had to do. All, well, again, all of you. But yeah, that's, that's great. That's excellent. And I just want to mention Duet and the amazing... Of course, yes. Harris Eulen. Harris Eulen. Harris Eulen. I just recently watched the show because I was uh, going to talk about it for a podcast, and he makes me cry every single time. Yeah. Uh, he, he was just remarkable. Harris was standing next to me when I met Kitty. Was he really? Oh, good? that's awesome. Yeah. Oh, that's great. Uh, a wonderful actor. Moment on duet. Director. Women did not get to play. I mean, that's the kind of man against man you know, kind of interrogation or whatever scene. I can't think of many women that got to play that role. Not many, no. That's it's Silence of the Lambs, I think. You're right, and you brought that up on my podcast when we yeah. talked about it. Absolutely, yeah, yeah, yeah. Very cool. Thank you so much. That was Thank awesome. You. Thank you. I hope everyone doesn't mind that I interject while you guys are asking questions. I, you know. It's please. your show, man. Thanks, Andy. You know. Thanks, Andy. <laughs> yeah, I wanted to say thank you for being here and, um, as I was growing up, um, my parents, they were big Star Trek fans, and I tried to get my kids, my, I have two sets of kids, I have an older set of kids and now, and a new marriage of younger kids, and the older kids would never, no matter how much I tried, they would never want to watch Star Trek. But, as you already alluded to, there was the Take Me Out to the Hollow Suite episode, the baseball episode, and every time that comes on, they would always love it, and they, they always quote it to this day. And um, <laughs> my middle son is no longer with us, oh, but he always sorry. loved the episode. <clears throat> and I just wanted to thank you guys for making that. And it's even uh, the older son, when it, it comes on to this day, he, he watches it, and, and he, he calls me every time, and he, he mentions about you know the times we had. So I just wanted to let you guys know, just thank you for making that episode. And I... And, Nana already touched on it, you know, the, 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 um, something from that, but I just want to know if there was anything else that you guys, you know, just for me, if there's anything else you remember from filming that episode. Thank you Ooh, very much. Oh, cool. Thank you. If I'm, and you know, one of the great things that we hear on a regular basis that you just did is uh, it's very nice to be told how good our work is, and we're very flattered by that. But, but the thing that touches me the most is that your kind of story that you just told us about family getting together and watching the show as a family, yeah. that, that they made time for each other. And it's not that you made time for the show, it's that you family got together and made time for yourselves to watch it. And, and that watching our show and perhaps other shows as well remind you of, t of good times in the past. That is, for me, is the most flattering thing yeah. that I can hear. Yeah. There's so much that changes in life, but it's, I, and I have comfort shows too, that you watch and you and you remember who you were with, what you were feeling, what when you watch the show again. So I I, I love that we're 
a part of people's lives like that. Thanks for sharing that. Hi, let me this one. Okay. Hi, my name is Matt, and I thank you again for doing the Richard II play with my friend Sean a few years ago. I forced him to Richard the Third. Was it? I thought it was. The, I don't. He, I didn't remember which one it was. He told me uh, how many Richards are there. Don't ask. Him. Um, I made him watch some of the episodes of the show before physically meeting you, and I like watched the watch the uh, pilot and watch duet. He's like, "Why?" Well, like, just don't argue. Just watch them, and you'll see why. And but again, thank you for the show entirely, and then carrying on into Star Trek Online, which has some terrific stories, and just many wonderful moments that would have been cool if they could have continued from the show in general, but thank you for both things all together. Just that pretty now, much sums up. Now, were you talking about Armin's Richard III? No, the one you did. You did Richard II. Richard II. Oh, yes, I was. Yeah, apologies. You did Richard II. I did oh, wow. Richard II. Oh, cool. Oh, sorry, my ego got in the way. I'm so terribly sorry. <laughs> it, was the, uh, it was the online play. It was the online play during COVID. Yes, he yes. Was like, wow. He's like, I'm uh, actually, I think the director of it is here, Jane Farnell. Yeah. So thank you. You worked Jane. with my friend. That's awesome. Because when he told me, he's like, yeah, there's one of the actors that's named Not a Visitor. And I'm like, wait a minute, say that name again? I'm like, you're making a play with Kieran Reese and proceed to profanely respond for the next few minutes, but yes. And also thank you for telling him he has one of the best Scottish accents you've ever heard. <laughs> He's not Scottish at all. That's pretty much sums up. Thank you for everything. Thank you for the That's show. That's great. That's great. Do all of you know, and we're running short, so I'll ask people that are asking questions to be as quickly as possible. Do all of you know about uh, Sid's site, Sid City? And do you guys know about the performance that all three of them did with Sid? That it was kind of an after DF9 thing. Some people are nodding. If you haven't heard it or watched it, it's on YouTube under Sid's YouTube channel, Sid City, I believe. Yeah. And it's this great post, what we left behind story. And also, Sirak is in it as well. And it's a fantastic story. Sid takes the lead, but all of them appear. And they're all wonderful in it. So I encourage you, if you haven't seen it, and you're jonesing for a new story, there you go. Please, sir. So I guess I'll start off by saying, uh, Andrew, when are you going to start in one of the Richard, sh uh, Richard stories? <laughs> oh, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> no, Richard. I mean, 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 one of the, I did it. We no, did Richard it. the second together, actually. Yeah. <laughs> That's great. Okay, well, perfect. You you're all set. That's it. So, so my name's yeah, Robert. I, I want to say, Nana, we missed you yesterday for the karaoke. I hope you're feeling better. Thank you. Uh, we actually had informally about 20 people. We closed down the place on Sweet Caroline. They had to cut ah, us off. Wonderful. But we kept on singing. But you were, you were missed. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank so, you. So, um, again, um, like some other, other, other people have said, you guys were, uh, I will say, I was born in 66. So the old generation, I remember it because I remember pretty well. I remember that as, a, as a, an infant. Um, so I love that show. Next Generation was a little hard, you know, for, for me sure. to go with. You know, I found the Deep Space Nine, that became my adult show. And that's the one I had with my parents, you know, my brothers, so just very cherished. And each of you sitting in, you guys sat in your character so beautifully. Kira, your eye contact, uh, I'm sorry, as Kira, Nana, your eye contact was so good, you made us feel like you were physically bigger and you commanded that, that presence that character so well. Andrew, I loved how you, it's like the, the, the visuals and the sound and the, something changed when you acted. You just, sh all eyes on you, I just focused in on you because you commanded the scene. You slowed down time for me. Every time you were in there, it's just fantastic. And Armin, I mean, you, in, the, in, the, in your club, you just kind of like, you were a part of the club, and the way you kind of moved around, you were in such command, and it was just wonderful. I love that I saw you as the principal later in Buffy, but my favorite is really you in that, and I just thank you guys so much for that. My question is, since you guys uh, kind of broke the mold with Star Trek, you guys went from those shows being, where, hey, we're out in the universe, we can fly, we can have chase scenes, we can go off and planet, we do all these fun moving things. You guys were space locked as actors. Did you find it challenging to try to imbue a sense of movement, motion, something to make up for the lack of all of that that those other shows had? 
That's a really good question. Actually. It is, but no, because, you know, the traveling we mm -hmm. did, I remember Avery mm -hmm. telling me this years ago, the, 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 the traveling was from here to here, That's a wonderful. short journey, but a very uh, impactful and important one. So that filled everything that, that, we, that I was constantly trying to figure out this humanoids journey mm -hmm. and and failing and another thing women weren't allowed to do back in the day mm -hmm. failing and learning and making mistakes and getting better so that was a lot of movement inside that's right wonderful answer well put i don't yeah, it's perfect that's right. yeah well thank you all so much for being here uh thank you a bit of a dream come true so thank you thank you cool thank you, thank you. cool all right, we're running close on time, so I hope we can get to everybody. Please, sir. Uh, so I was perfectly content to watch my DVDs of uh, Deep Space Nine for a long time, and then what we left behind came out, and they have these beautiful shots from film. Um, right. Does Deep Space Nine, the objectively best Star Trek, have any chance of getting the TNG remaster <laughs> treatment and coming out where we can see the beautiful sets and costumes and everything that, that you, you know, know. I don't get it. Today. I don't know. Uh, you know, you, 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 we're sitting here and, you know, we're wondering, gee, listen, I'm not putting down TNG. You know, that, that show was what it was. Sure. You know, and, and things evolve. You know, I mean, certainly from the first, you know, series that we all love. I mean, you know, I mean, you know, but then going to, you know, next generation, you know, it, it's, it's like the evolution of, of, of uh, I mean, of storytelling and, 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 uh, and, 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 the, and the company of actors that we had who were, I mean, extra, I mean extraordinary actors. Again, I'm not putting them down, oh, but and, this was a great company of actors and, and the writing was superb. And the fact that, that we, we, we are treated the way we are treated is baffling to me. It's okay. It's just the way the world goes. The world is not fair. But it, it isn't fair. I mean, this, this, this series should, should be, 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 you know, given all of the technological uh, assistance and boost that, that it well deserves. No question. <laughs> And not to, see it soon. not to obligate them, but knowing as, as someone not involved with the show, Paramount, you know, just got sold. I hope that the new owners will have the, the funds yeah. because it is seven seasons and over a hundred episodes. Right. I mean, good Lord, several hundred episodes. Oh, several for you guys. Hundred. Those are the days when we did how many episodes? 26. 26 a Can year. Can you imagine 26 of the of, uh, episodes a year of, of this kind of work? And, you know, I mean, unbelievable. I mean, whereas H HBO barely squeezes out eight or 10, you know? <laughs> uh, and, you know, I mean, and, and a lot of that is just absolute bullshit, you know? Yeah. I mean, yeah. And, they, they, they've just fall, fallen in love. They've fallen in love with their dragons and their technology, and, and there's no goddamn story left. Here he goes. Here he goes. I love it. I love it. And it's true. The writing and the characters is what makes Star Trek stand out and persist and endure. So it's probably the final question. I'm so sorry. I hope you guys will go to their tables and ask your questions directly. I won't rant, I promise you. The, <laughs> the ranting is over. All right. Yeah, it is. It's the best part. Exactly. Uh, thank you all. Um, I love the show, like everyone here. It's one of the very few shows that when it ended, I actually said to myself, do I want to watch anything else now? <laughs> I was sad when the show ended. But like everyone else here like said, um, what they loved is that the various character arcs and how each of your characters changed by the end of the show. What I also loved was the very different relationships between all the different characters. Like, for example, each of you had a different relationship, your characters, with somebody like Odo. Um, so my question was, do you have a favorite relationship you had with another character, whether friend or foe? It was Odo yeah. and, and Renee, definitely. Yeah, yeah I mean, that's something. Absolutely. Well, without Sid, I wouldn't be here. Oh, there you <laughs> That's go. That's it. That's cool. Yeah. Um, certainly, Odo. Uh, Renee and I were very <laughs> close and hated each other. Uh, no, o Odo and Quark didn't like each other. That's it, right. it was a love-hate relationship. But I, 
I had a beautiful relationship with Ram, with Nog, yeah. with Cecily, who played uh, Moogie. Um, um, yeah, uh, uh, they were, you know, I, I was part of Deep Space Nine, but my storylines tended to be different than the rest of the thrust of the show. So I was sort of on my own little show. Um, <laughs> and so those are the characters I most related to. But, but certainly, Odo, Renee and I were extraordinarily close. Well, forgive. Yeah, thank you. Please, Andy. No, I was just waving, giving a wave to Renee. Oh, there you go. Yeah, indeed. Absolutely. A wonderful performance. And again, all three of them had amazing moments with Odo and Renee, obviously. Um, not to self-promote, but truly, if you want to learn more beyond what we just heard in the last hour, I just did interviews with Nana and Armin, and they're at wordballoon.com, and you can find them. And then last summer, right around the time of Terrificon, I had a great conversation with Andy. And again, guys, I'm one of you. I am such a fan. So it, it was a pleasure to talk to him then. It's an honor to have moderated the panel. Before, I, I hope you enjoy please. Before you finish, if please, I may Armin. self Oh, yes, Armin, by all means, yes, please. If you're interested in finding out uh, more about each of the episodes of Deep Space Nine, please go to Delta Flyers, where Terry and I uh, have been, and others, uh, has done a yes. couple. Andy's about to do one. Uh, some of the other people involved in the show also. Uh, uh, where we take, we look at the, each episode uh, uh, really analytically and, and really shot by shot, scene by scene, and, and get some, some memories of the people who were involved in the production of, the, of that particular episode. Yeah. Yeah, great observations. Is there anything else you guys wanted to add? No. I, I, I mean, Armin, I, and forgive me, I really wanted to acknowledge the, the great charity work that you and your wife do and everybody. Thank you. Oh, so, absolutely, yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah. Yeah, uh, um, I'm not going to tell you now, but uh, okay. uh, look me up and ask about PanCan, which is pancreatic cancer, which my wife is a survivor of. Well, and I'm happy to say Aaron and I covered it in our conversation as well. So you guys were great. Great questions. Thank and you. really yeah. appreciate Thank your you attention. So Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Hi, this is Michael Shanks, and you're watching Phantom Spotlight. Be sure to like, share, and subscribe. The fate of the universe may depend on it. Oh, and have fun and follow your fandom. <laughs>